In 42 days, I will be graduating with a degree in anthropology and a double minor in civic interfaith and international studies from Baylor University. My graduation from Baylor was a bit questioned at first, and that's not because I didn't love school or I wasn't invested in what I was studying, but rather it was because I was a Muslim hijabi woman away from home at the first time at a conservative Baptist university in the midst of a global pandemic. My college career was spent in this in-between space, but I'm finally gonna make it. And in the fall of 2023, God willing, I will be starting law school. Being a minority at a predominantly white institution comes with knowing that you have to work sometimes twice as hard as your white counterparts for the same opportunities. And that is because you know that sometimes people will look at your name or see who you are and judge you based off of that rather than your abilities. And in the midst of a global pandemic, I was left internship list for my first college summer. And for me, that was a big deal. I started thinking about how my career was going to formulate, what am I gonna do next? But amidst all of that, my mom approached me with an email that she had gotten from an organization named Minaret Foundation. They were looking for remote government relations interns. And in the middle of a global pandemic, that was a godsend. I applied for the position and about a week later I began and I joined them for their inaugural cohort of interns. A couple of weeks into my time at Minaret Foundation, I was invited, I was invited to a one-on-one -on -one meeting with the organization's executive director. And I was terrified. Um, I thought about every sort of mistake I could have made. I asked myself if I sent the wrong email, did I, did I lose a file? And as I waited for his icon to pop up on my Zoom screen, I took a deep breath. And in the end, I was offered an opportunity that's changed my life. The organization's executive director asked me to come back to the organization as a senior government relations intern to train to take on the role of government relations coordinator. And I was excited. And it wasn't because I thought that it was a career defining moment. But rather, it was because I knew that this incredible group of folks wanted to change the world, and I wanted to join them in that mission. When I first arrived at Minaret Foundation, there was no policy department. There was no legislative strategy, agenda, a policy platform. It was just that incredible group of individuals committed to interfaith work. And so between the time that I became senior government relations intern and then joined as a staff member, we came up with a policy. And that policy is No Kids in Cuffs. No Kids in Cuffs is a policy that sought to limit the use of restraints on children under the age of 10. Over 75,000 students across the US are restrained annually. Over 45,000 of those students are students in Texas. 91% of all of these students are students with disabilities. Even though students with disabilities only make up about 10% of the total student population. That is a stark overrepresentation of students with disabilities. And there's three main types of restraint that we really need to know. There's physical restraint, which is holding a child down to the ground, sometimes kneeling on them. And these are children as young as five. There's mechanical restraint handcuffs, zip ties, ropes, children tied to desks, handcuffed and dragged out of their classrooms. And then there's chemical restraint, which is the use of mace, pepper spray, and sedative drugs and tranquilizers not prescribed to that child. And this is happening in our classrooms every single day. When we developed this policy, all we had in mind were helping protect our Texas children. But in the end, this policy brought together both the left and the right to help protect our Texas children. This policy was hyper bipartisan. We chose partnership instead of partisanship. We made sure that folks could come together to help these children. And with this policy, we created a coalition, the No Kids in Cuffs Coalition. 
this coalition brought together juvenile justice organizations, disability rights groups. It brought together experts in the field of criminal justice. It brought together the most conservative organizations in the state and the most progressive organizations in the state. And at the head of all of this was a faith-led nonprofit. Something to know about Minaret Foundation is that it roots itself in the Muslim faith and works within the multi-faith community. And for the first time, a Muslim organization entered the world of domestic child welfare policy. For the first time, Muslims were seen as the experts on policies that were not directly linked to our oppression. We weren't thought of as the experts of Islamophobia or immigration. We were thought of the experts in domestic child welfare policy, and that was groundbreaking. Not only for Texas, but for our nation. You see, after seeing so much success in Texas, no kids in cuffs ultimately died in the Texas Senate. We had one day left of the Senate, and the session ended, and there was our bill, dead and gone. But there's victory in all of that sadness, because we saw this as an opportunity to take what we did here in Texas and model it at the federal level. And we're doing so with Congresswoman Sylvia Garcia's office, and we're beyond excited for that. Being a Muslim organization and being a Muslim woman has put me in the position where I'm allowed to talk about my faith multiple times. Most of the conversations I have, especially here in the Baylor campus, are related to faith. And I am eternally grateful for that. I chose to wear the hijab at the age of 16. And that came with the choice of being a representative of my faith. And I love to sit down with folks and talk about faith, how Islam is life-changing, and how the Lord shows us grace and mercy every single day. And that's wonderful. But I believe as a society, it's time for us to move past that. You accept our identity as Muslim women, as Muslim people, but see us as something larger. See us as the depth of the people. We are a, we're Muslim people in policy. We're Muslim people in school. And I hope that as we move forward, we're going to be able to do that as a society. That we're able to sit down with someone and see them as a whole story. I want to be able to sit down with folks and tell them about my studies in anthropology, politics, policy, and so much more. My mind often drifts to Audre Lorde. Audre Lorde wrote about how she was more than just her struggles as a Black woman. She wrote about how she wanted her folks and her colleagues in academia to know that her identity as a Black woman colored the, the pieces of her life and her research. And I relate to Audre Lorde's sentiment. As much as I love talking about Islam and about how it's changed my life, I also want to talk about the things that I do and work in, in my expertise. And it may seem as if I'm saying that we need to move away from asking folks questions. We need to move away from addressing identity, but it's the opposite. I want us all here today to see people as a whole person not just representatives of an identity group or a part of the world or a religion, but we see them as a person, a person with a whole story. And so my task for all of you here today is to be curious, to reach out to your neighbors, the person sitting next to you, and get to know them as a whole person, not just part of their identity. Get to know how their identity colors the parts of their life, and how it inspires them to do the work that they do. I'm grateful to be a Muslim woman, and I am grateful to be able to wear the hijab. And I'm grateful I'm here with all of you guys to talk about my identity. And so, if you want, if you see me around Waco, I'm happy to get a cup of coffee with you. I'm happy to talk about Islam. I'm happy to talk about how it interacts with politics and international policy. But I'm also happy to get to know you as your story. I want to see pictures of your cats, your dogs, your house plants, your kids, but I also want to know about something you learned that week, your favorite book, your very favorite TV show. I want to know you as a person. And so I want us to take away from this is that we, want, we need to get to know each other as whole people. The same way the Minaret Foundation allowed me to get to know others. As a Muslim woman, I've been allowed and given the opportunity to walk into legislative offices with my hijab, 
to sit down with representatives and senators to talk to them about child welfare policy, religious liberty, food insecurity, and so much more. And now, the folks that previously may have seen the Muslim community as dangerous or violent have that image replaced with the image of their Muslim friends. And that's what I want us all to do here today. Replace those biases that you may have with a new story and a new friend. So let's get a cup of coffee. Let's talk about your favorite TV show. And I'd be happy to show you a picture of my cat Snoops. <laughs>